So good evening and thank you everyone for tuning in. My name is Luke Gustafson and I work for University of Maryland Extension in Charles County, Maryland in Southern Maryland. Uh, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Myth Maryland geography. Um, I'll be talking about vegetable gardening in small spaces. So hopefully whatever kind of area that you have to grow in, you'll find something that is useful in tonight's talk. And for tonight's talk, I'm going to focus on on growing in containers as well as in raised beds. Um, you can also grow in small spaces and hydroponics, but that's a, a whole separate topic. So for tonight, I'm going to be talking about growing outdoors in containers in in uh, raised beds or in small in ground gardens as well. So again, thank you for everyone tuning in and here we go. All right. It's great when technology works and it looks like it's going all right so far. So University of Maryland Extension is the outreach arm of the University of Maryland. And um, if you're tuning in from another state, um, the extension service in your state is through the local land grant uh, university in, in your state. And again, we're the outreach arm. We focus on providing research unbiased information on a range of topics. And um, so my specialty is, is horticulture. I work with homeowners and with a great group of master gardener volunteers um, who, who really try and um, help homeowners um, and, and folks to, to grow um, beautiful, productive gardens in a sustainable way. And so for tonight, Here's just a brief outline. I'm going to go over some of the, you know, the whys of vegetable gardening. Obviously, if you've tuned in, you have an interest for, you know, one or more reasons that you want to start growing vegetables or continue growing vegetables. And you can do that in, in small spaces. Um, you don't have to have a lot. And I encourage people to, to start small and, and build off of that. Moving into the how, we're going to talk about you know choosing a place to to have your your garden, um, as well as what you're growing in, be it containers, different sizes of containers, raised beds, and so forth, as well as some of the issues with maintenance, some of the considerations as you start to to set up your gardening in in small spaces, um, as well as some of the crops that you might be considering for your garden and there most of these crops will be ones that do especially well in southern maryland but depending on your location um, you should be able to grow most all of these crops maybe with slightly different timing uh, if you're farther north or if you're farther south then you might have to adjust that that planting window all right and as a side note for those of you who are, who are outside maryland or outside the mid-Atlantic region. If you want state-specific info, you can, uh, one simple way is just via search engine. So you just take your, your state, uh, the topic, be it vegetable gardening, or you know if you're interested in, in native plants or ornamentals, and um, then typing edu after that, and that will give you um, sites that are linked to um, university or another .edu. Um, and again, it's just one uh, quick way of filtering out information on the web there and getting you more specific information for your region. Um, so with that, um, I want to start off with this quote. And for those of you that tuned in to last week's talk on vegetable gardening, I shared this as well. But uh, this is a quote and maybe some of you guys are familiar with it or can guess who might have, have said this. If you think you might know, you can throw that in the, in the chat. Um, but the most valuable of all arts will be the art of deriving a comfortable subsistence from the smallest area of soil. So this is something we think about when we're talking about food gardening, not that we're going to provide all of our calorie needs from a small space. Um, so we have a couple different 
guesses in the chat box, um, mostly, yeah, founding fathers that people are guessing, and the correct answer, if we go, there we go, was Abraham Lincoln in an address to the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society. So this was uh, a, just before, or the year before he was elected. All right, so kudos to you that, that guessed it correctly. Um, but again, it's not something that we are probably going to do on a small area, um, but certainly that, that feeling of being able to grow some of your own food, there's a, there's a certain self-satisfaction in that, and especially with all the things, certainly now with COVID-19 and um, looking at the news and, and so forth, just being able to go out and do something um, can be very empowering, right? To grow at least a small amount of, of your food. All right. So that leads me to some of the, the pros, you know, the, the reasons that people might say to, um, uh, as, as, as reasons why they grow vegetables. Um, so some of the pros that I came up with here, and I'm sure you could come up with, with others, are, you know, flavor, nutrition, cost. Sometimes when you grow it yourself, it, it's more expensive because there's, there's uh, material costs and so forth, especially if you're new to gardening. Um, but sometimes, you know, you can, you can come out ahead um, just from an economic standpoint. Uh, there's the aesthetics, the beauty. Some of these plants, uh, aside from being delicious, are also very ornamental, as well as, you know, some of the other benefits, physical activity, again, that kind of mental health aspect of getting out in the garden and, and getting some exercise and doing something rewarding. Um, as well as, especially now with, with kids home from school, getting the, the kids out and um, getting their, their hands in the soil and teaching them the whole you know, life cycle, nurturing, caring for, for something else that's, that's living. Um, there's a lot of really valuable lessons in the garden. And I think particularly in the vegetable garden. Some of the, the cons or challenges and maybe some of the barriers that have kept you from growing vegetables if you're just new to it this season, uh, list out here. Um, and they can be, there can be others on, on top of these as well, but time certainly. Um, maybe you have more time now uh, than in the past. Uh, space, you know, where am I gonna grow? I don't have a whole lot of area. And, and hopefully we can overcome some of that um, with, with some of the ideas here tonight. Uh, materials cost certainly can be a barrier, especially you know, if you go out to the store, um, some of the stuff is, is, can be expensive, especially if you're doing it on, uh, if you're buying a number of bags of potting mix and so forth, and, and large transplants especially, they can, can be fairly expensive. And especially if, if you know, rabbits come in and, and steal your, your harvest just before you can pick it, then that, you know, that one tomato maybe that you harvest off the plant, if you, if you costed it out and figured out a um, cost per pound, then maybe it'd be expensive. Um, so that, that can certainly be a, a con or a challenge. Uh, as well as knowledge, right? Like maybe you're new to the region and you don't know what grows well, don't know what time of year. Uh, so we can certainly help to address that, that last point here in, in tonight's talk. All right. So some of, the, some of the ingredients that you need for a, um, uh, for growing, uh, would be a site, right? Figuring out what works best. Uh, do you have, you know, do you live in a townhouse and you have a, a small backyard? Well, you know, then then that's where you're going to grow. Uh, or maybe all you have is a is a sunny window, and you can grow things in that. Although you'll be more limited. Let's see. Uh, water certainly is required for any plant to grow especially during the hot, dry parts of the summertime. They're going to need a lot of water, so you'll have to keep an eye on that so your plants don't, don't run out of that. Um, and think about 
that in relation to your location and what's a convenient spot for you to water and where will you see the plants and maybe you'll see them on your way out the door to work in the morning or when you come back in the evening and that'll be a reminder oh yeah uh, i need to get out there and, and water those plants as well as labor right some of the challenges to, to gardening is you know like i mentioned time think about okay you know even if you have a lot of energy now uh, what is your schedule like um, throughout the season and uh, will you be able to maintain that beyond you know your initial enthusiasm of, of planting the garden um, so again i encourage people to start small and especially if they're new to vegetable gardening that way they they won't just get frustrated and, and throw in the towel um, so really starting with with smaller spaces like like we're talking about tonight is is a great way for for beginners um, as far as the location the site ideally you want a full sun location you can get by with partial shade um, and <clears throat> and you can grow things especially leafy greens and herbs where you're harvesting just the the leaves that doesn't take as much energy from the sun to produce anything that produces fruit like tomato cucumber squash and things like that again the more sun you give it the the better it will be and the more harvest you'll you'll get off those plants um, so if at all possible choose that that sunniest location um, and uh, I mentioned access to water, protection from wildlife. Again, they, wildlife can be a, a big issue in smaller spaces. If you're thinking about patios, sometimes that can give you a bit of protection from animals. Um, and let's see. Um, so if you're, if you're growing closer to the house, especially if you have an animal, a dog, then that can reduce some of the the animal issues, especially things like deer coming up and and taking some of your uh, nibbling on your plants. Um, but that certainly can be an issue. So like I mentioned, yeah, you can grow in windows. If if that is all you have, then you can make do with that. And again, that'd be a good place for for greens and for herbs. And really, those are some of the really nice crops to grow. Herbs, fresh herbs can be very expensive when you buy them at the grocery store. If you think about a, just a small package of basil can be two to three dollars, but you can, even if you buy a, a basil plant, um, so you can buy a, a basil transplant uh, for about four dollars, sometimes less, and put that into a larger pot, and then you can have basil throughout the season. Um, some of the other fresh herbs, again, are, are expensive to buy from the grocery store. So you really get the most bang for your buck in small spaces by, by, using, by growing some of those fresh herbs if you're used to adding them to your cooking um, because you're saving those from your, your food dollars. Um, and again, you know, south-facing windows are going to be your, your sunniest windows. So if that's what you have, you know, use those, those south-facing windows. Um, whether it's on a windowsill or, or a table, uh, the farther that you get from the window, even if it's light, um, you won't have that same intensity of light. Um, and it's both the, the length of light and the, the intensity of light that, that determine how much, how much uh, photosynthesis can happen. Moving outside, uh, we have a lot of different containers that um, you should see on the slide there. And with containers, you can you can use a lot of different things. You can recycle things maybe from around your yard. If you have other uh, pots that you've used, you can um, repurpose those. Like uh, if you have purchased ornamental plants and you have those containers sitting around, you can certainly grow those, uh, use those to grow herbs and vegetables. In the center there, I have that a seven gallon pot. And if you're growing um, full size tomato plants, it is a good idea to have um, a, a fair amount of soil. And so about a five to seven gallon container is a good size for a single tomato plant. If you have smaller containers than that, 
there are some um, really compact or dwarf varieties of, of tomatoes that, that work. Um, but just as you're thinking through what you have and, and how many plants you might purchase, you know, think about one, one large plant, like one tomato plant for, for a kind of four to seven gallon pot like that. For greens, you can get by with smaller containers like that lettuce box in the upper corner of the slide. That's something that is pretty portable. Greens grow relatively quickly and they don't require that much rooting depth. So you can use those shallower containers and also not use as much potting mix by growing some of the, the quick growing things like, like lettuce and other types of greens in, in shallow containers like a lettuce box. Uh, if you go to a dollar store, you can pick up the inexpensive laundry baskets like I have down there. That one is you know, a 99 cent or $1 basket um, with a little bit of newspaper lining it. That's just to keep some of that potting mix from, from going out those, those large holes in the side of the container. And um, again, really inexpensive container, um, you know, 99 cents plus the, the cost of the potting mix. So in that case, the potting mix is the, is the more expensive part of, of that setup. Um, and that is, that's a sweet potato that's growing out of the laundry basket. But you could also grow tomatoes in there. You could grow uh, cucumbers and have them uh, vining upward on some type of trellis. All right. And if you are growing in containers, especially if you're repurposing those containers, like using a, a storage tote or a bucket, something that didn't come wasn't sold for, for growing um, as, a, as a pot, you definitely will want to add some drainage holes. And you can do that just with a, a drill or you can, you can cut them out with a, with a sharp knife. And uh, you want that water, the rainwater, when we have a large rainfall, like an inch, inch and a half or so forth, you don't want that water just sitting and pooling in the bottom of that container because the plant roots need oxygen to breathe, just like you and I, because uh, those plant roots are respiring. And if they're in completely saturated soil, there's not the oxygen that they need, so they will, will die. So definitely, whatever kind of container you're growing in, make sure that you have drainage holes in the bottom to prevent that. All right. Um, yeah, you can take a lot of different containers. This is a picture from our porch a couple years ago. So we have a kind of a smattering of different containers. Um, you can be formal, you can be informal like this. And again, you've got a couple different examples. You've got some nursery containers, those black plastic ones. There's some colorful ones and some laundry baskets in there as well. All right. So Moving up a little bit larger than that are our raised containers. And these are a good option for folks that are more limited mobility gardeners. Some of them, depending on, on how you build them and the, and the clearance underneath, can be used with, um, with folks in, in wheelchairs. They could wheel up to it and, um, you know, like, like they could a table. And then the gardening is, is right there at their height. Um, and there's no bending over, there's no stooping down to, to tend the garden, to plant it, or to harvest. So that's certainly a, a good option um, for, for people that, that like it at, at the higher heights, um, and especially for limited uh, mobility folks. And this one, for example, this is actually uh, at a demonstration garden in Washington County, Maryland, and it's a, a uh, plastic drum it just cut in half the long way. And so you could make two beds out of that. And it's just built, uh, they built a frame around that to a wooden frame to support the weight of that container. And there is drainage holes in the bottom. And I think in the lower image, you can see that there have been, there's been water that, you know, that drains out those, those holes in the bottom. Uh, so again, they, they uh, won't get, won't get waterlogged and the roots won't die when we have 
a good summer rainfall. All right. Raised beds, um, that's kind of the larger of the small spaces that we're talking about tonight. Um, the nice thing about raised beds is that it clearly defines the garden. So this, you know, where the garden stops and where it, where it starts. And so that, that can be useful if you are, you know, for, for mowing around it. And it can also be useful for, for kids to, to know, okay, I can step here, but I don't step there because I'm going to, you know, crunch the tomatoes. Um, and um, as far as the, the sizing of them, you want, the idea is that a raised bed, you won't have to, to be stepping in the middle during the season. So you don't want it, you don't want them very wide Usually they're up to four feet in, in width, so you can easily reach to the center of the bed uh, without having to, to get up and step into that garden. So it reduces uh, soil compaction since you're not walking around in the garden a whole lot uh, or not, not at all during the growing season. Um, you can use different materials to build the sides of it, uh, wood or, or masonry. Most commonly, uh, they're made out of wood. Uh, as well as things like the plastic lumber. Um, and I wanted to note that the modern, the new pressure treated lumber uh, does not contain ar arsenic compounds. Um, it's a, a copper based compound. So um, you can use that in, in raised beds um, and it will, will hold up better certainly than, than just untreated pine. As far as filling the beds, I'll talk a little bit more about soil versus potting mix in um, a couple slides here, but um, you can use just the, the native soil around you if you have some from, from another part of your yard or as you're building the beds, if you are shoveling out for the, the pathway, you can certainly save that soil and use that to, to fill the raised beds. Um, and, and so you don't necessarily have to then you know, build the raised beds and have the expense of the materials plus have additional expense of of the soil. So if you have clean soil in your yard, clean meaning not not contaminated um, with with uh, heavy metals or or things like that, then then you certainly can just use a native soil that you have already, and, and reduce on on some of the cost there. All right. So um, here's an example of another raised bed just constructed um, and, and ready to be filled. Now, one of the nice things about raised beds is that if you are, you can put them on top of, of impervious surfaces, especially if you're growing in an urban environment, um, then you may be growing on top of you know, concrete or or pavement. And so you can put raised beds on impervious services, but in that case, you would want to have drainage out the sides of the, the raised bed because you can think of the raised bed as one giant container. And since you can't get drainage out the bottom, you want to add that to the side. So just putting a, a gap in the boards um, is, can, can give you some drainage out the side. Um, if the underlying soil is contaminated, and we think of that most often in urban environments, but there can be other sources of contamination, you know, industrial sites and so forth. Um, even you know, if, there, if your property is where there used to be a, a burn pile, there's potential for, for lead contamination of, of your soil um, just because of the, the solder from, from the old uh, tin cans. Um, that can be a, a source of, of, of lead contamination in, in rural locations as well. Um, so not to, not to scare you, but um, it, it is a good idea to, to send off a soil sample to a lab for, for testing. And for about $15, you can um, get it tested for, for lead as well. Um, so, and if you don't want the, the roots to reach out into the other layers of soil, either to, to keep it contained if you're growing something like, like mint or a plant that, that you want in your garden but has a tendency to spread, um, you can also put down some type of a, a barrier to, to keep those roots just in, in that raised bed. Um, but 
in other cases, you don't need to put a, a liner in the bottom. Uh, and again, that in this case, the liner is, is uh, uh, pervious, so it's letting water through um, if you're growing on, on top of a, um, a pervious surface like in this photo, this photo. All right. So potting mix versus potting soil or, or soil. And if you go out to the garden centers and big box stores this time of year, you see all kinds of bagged products and um, there's a lot of different things out there. Um, but just a kind of quick definition, um, if it says potting mix and it does not contain the word soil, then typically, um, typically that potting mix, it, we're referring to things that are mostly organic matter. So things like peat, compost, core, uh, that's a coconut core, or wood products, so shredded wood chips and things like that, uh, as well as, as things like uh, vermiculite and, and perlite, which are actually minerals. Um, but those are the things we, we think of in potting mix. Um, and, and this is, it, it's lighter weight when it's dry, right? So if you think about things like peat, certainly very lightweight when it's dry, they have the ability to absorb a lot of water, which is good. That means that your pots can, can hold a fair amount of water. And so when you water them thoroughly, then they're, they're fully soaked up with water and they have a fair amount of reserve. Um, so they can, can use that water throughout the day. The downside of that, in, especially in, in things like raised beds, is that it does it shrinks over time because it is plant matter, decaying plant matter in different stages. Uh, so over time, that, that will reduce in size just through the natural decomposition process. Uh, whereas soil is, is predominantly mineral based. So sand, silt, and clay are the different uh, soil particles. And um, again, if you have some soil in your yard that you can move um, or your raised beds and can, can take some of what you're excavating and, and use that to help fill the raised beds, you can save on, on cost. And, and that is more stable over time because the you know, sand, silt, and clay doesn't break down like your, like your organic matter um, because, because it's not, not plant-based. Um, and you can certainly blend soil with, with a, a good quality compost to, to add some organic matter. Maybe you're starting off with the soil that's um, a bit compacted, or um, somewhat heavy, especially if you have finer textured, like more clay containing soils, uh, you can certainly add compost to that. Um, but uh, just the, the act of, of loosening it and digging it up um, and adding some organic matter to it um, can improve some of the physical properties of, of your soil. Um, so if you're going out to the store and, you're, and you see stuff that's called potting soil, usually that's a mixture of of both uh, mineral soil and some of those organic materials like compost and, and shredded wood products. Um, and again, the, the more soil it has, uh, the heavier it is to, to work with, to, to haul, um, but the less it will shrink over time. All right, so how much to buy? Um, it depends on, on what you're growing, but just some kind of rules of thumb here. A cubic foot, which most products are sold by the cubic foot if it comes in a bag, is about eight gallons. So if you get a two cubic foot bag, then you got 16 gallons. And, and a cubic yard, of course, is 23, 27 cubic feet. If you're buying materials in bulk, it's usually sold by the yard. Uh, so if you have a pickup truck and go some can go to pick up something, or if you can get delivery of it, um, typically it's a lot cheaper buying it by the yard if you need that that kind of quantity. All right. As far as bag products, there's a number of different certifications out there for uh, things like potting mix and potting soils. There's the Mulch and Soil Council. And they have a number of different categories. You see that photo here. Premium potting mix is one of them, as well as different types of soils. Um, 
So not all products have a certification. Um, the certification um, just means that they agree to, to certain labeling standards and that they also submit to random testing. Um, so, you know, it's a generally a good thing to see, but um, I would also, anytime you're looking at buying a bag product before you purchase it, take a look at, at what you're actually buying, what's inside the bag. You know, if you can, if they have an open bag, that's best. Um, if you can just pull the bag open a little bit to see what you're buying. If it's labeled as potting, uh, as, as, you know, raised bed soil, and it looks like it's actually more like mulch, then you might consider looking at another product. Uh, soil testing, if you, especially if you are growing in a new space this year, and again, if you're building raised beds or anything like that, uh, I recommend that you send off a sample of that soil for testing. Um, there's a great video on Maryland's Home and Garden Information Center on how to take that soil sample. But for about 10 to $15 per sample, you can send off um, a, about a cup and a half of that to the lab of your choosing. There's private labs as well as public universities that, that do soil testing. And um, that will give you information, accurate information on the, the soil pH, as well as the level of potassium, calcium, magnesium, and, and phosphorus are the four most common. And you can get more complicated and, and um, add other minerals for, for an additional cost. Um, if you're just starting out um, for a veggie garden, I would recommend uh, considering testing for, for lead just so you know um, it, you know what the the if there is any um, uh, concerning levels in in your soil. All right, moving on to fertilizer. Um, so it's it's something that that plants need those those mineral nutrients. Um, I encourage you with with fertilizer not to not to overdo it. If you have those soil test results from a lab, you can base your your fertilizers additions on the recommendations from the lab. Um, you also get nutrients as your compost and other organic materials in the soil break down. Um, so you do get that slow release nutrients from the organic matter in your soil, those, those composts, et cetera. Um, as, as well as you know, a couple other kind of general types of fertilizers are, are the water solu soluble fertilizers, the things like um, some of the, the types of miracle grow that you, you know, mix up in a can and, and can just apply with a, with a simple watering can. Um, the nice thing about the water soluble nutrients are that generally they're available for the plants to, to take up pretty quickly. Um, but the downside is that, again, being water soluble, they can wash out of the soil. So if you're expecting an inch of rain, then you know, you'd want to hold off on fertilizing until um, until we're in the in the clear for a little while. Um, so those those soluble nutrients don't just leach out, but the plant has has a chance to to uh, take them up into the root systems um, and to do that slowly, you know, throughout the season, especially um, as your cucumbers and tomatoes start to to bear fruit. That's when they have the most demand for nutrients. Um, there's a number of animal based products. They um, good portion of those nutrients are more slowly released. Uh, so the nitrogen in there um, releases over time. Um, but those are there's also um, some good products out there. Um, a lot of the animal based products, especially the bone meal products can be high in in phosphorus. So um, just keep an eye out for that. And if you have your your soil test results, um, oftentimes over over the years, you can get high phosphorus in vegetable gardens um, where you're continually adding um, nutrients. Um, so keep that, keep that in mind. And if, if your soil test says you have high phosphorus, then you don't need to add any in your, uh, in your fertilizers. Water in Maryland and much of the mid-Atlantic, you know, we're blessed with a a pretty good amount of rain, especially early in the season. But as we go later into July and August, then things can start drying out a bit. 
And um, if you're growing in containers, watering could be a, a daily or a couple times a week activity. And um, so there's certain ways that you can make that process simpler um, by soaker hoses, especially in, in raised beds. You can get a, a, a short soaker hose that can, can do some of the work for you as well as, as timers. If you're gonna be away, um, then, then timers are a good, good uh, option to, to make sure that your plants get, get watered. Mulch is another way to both manage the, the water and uh, reduce weed growth. Um, it reduces the, the water loss just to evaporation and um, it provides a, you know, a, a layer of mulch provides a barrier that, that prevents or reduces weeds sprouting up and, and competing with your, your plants. Um, if you do use a, a mulch, like a, a woody mulch, a coarse, chunky wood chip mulch is best. And you wanna keep that on the soil surface so if you have mulch on a bed and you're gonna go in and plant some little seeds, you just wanna rake that or pull that mulch back until those plants get established. And then you can, can um, slide the mulch back in place. Um, and when I say mulch, I'm talking, you know, like a three to four inch layer of, of mulch. If you only have like a, you know, inch or two, you'll, you'll see minimal uh, weed suppressing activity from from that amount of of mulch um, but but it will have have some benefit as far as reducing water loss all right um, as far as animals there's a number of them out there that are our most common kind of pests in the veggie garden um, things like birds rabbits groundhogs and deer and you know there's things that you can do to prevent that uh, the good thing about small spaces is that, you know, oftentimes, you know, if you're growing in a place like a, um, uh, in a townhouse and maybe you already have a fence that's up around your, your property. Um, so there's one, one option too is, uh, is animals. They can deter some of those uh, things like deer and, and rabbit. Um, so this is a, a garden dog and, um, so they, they can help out, um, but, but typically they don't um, prevent all animal activity. Again, if you're, if you're growing on a patio or something like that, generally the closer you keep it to your entrance, then the less likely they are to, to bother it. Or if you can, again, if there's any steps that they would have to climb up, those are, are ways to, to keep some of those other critters away. Um, and it can get challenging, it can get really tricky if you've got smaller things like squirrels that are hopping down um, and don't have a problem. Um, they're pretty good at acrobatics. Um, so you can think about if you just have a few containers, you can put up some chicken wire around those um, as a way to, to deter some of that. Um, you can use things like the bird netting, um, but if you do that, just remember to, to pull it tight because loose light materials like that bird netting can be a, a hazard for, for animals, um, especially birds to get tangled up in. Um, so if you do go that route, uh, please make sure it's, it's tight. Um, and here's a very lightweight fencing material around a, an in-ground garden. And um, this can last for a number of years. It's not particularly strong. So I suppose that something like a deer could push against it and break it. Um, but typically that's enough to provide some amount of deterrent and, you know, animals oftentimes will go for the, the low hanging fruit. And if there's some sort of barrier, but they can go to the neighbors or go to the woods next door and, and get what they're looking for, then um, that might be enough to, to keep them going on and, and not bother your plants. And then of course, there's a, a cat there that's staring down the deer. So maybe just giving it the eye is, is enough to scare that deer away. All right. Um, and as far as heights, you know, for fencing, um, for deer, they, they're great jumpers. So you wanna get something that's at least six feet tall. If it's not that tall, then again, it, sometimes a shorter fence can be a bit of a deterrent, um, but if you can go six feet or taller, 
then you're more likely to deter the deer. And for some of the burrowing critters like groundhogs, you want to, to bury the fencing so that, um, you know, bury it like a foot or so. So if they're tunneling, they'll, they'll run into that fencing and, um, and not, not be able to, to dig through into your garden. And if you're growing in raised beds, um, you can put um, some type of fencing, just lay it flat on the ground before you set down your, um, before you set down your, your timbers. And, and that can help to reduce stuff from, from burrowing up from underneath. All right, switching to our, our six-legged pests, the insects. Whatever crops you are growing, I encourage you to learn the key pests for your crops. And that guide on, um, on the website that I shared before I started the talk. Let's see, um, I'll share it again at the end. Um, there's a good handout from Purdue Extension that lists some of the key pests by crop. So if you're growing, for example, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, then you're almost certainly going to get a couple different species of caterpillars that like to eat them. And so you'll want to, to learn to recognize and identify those. If you're growing things like squash and zucchini, then you'll see this little guy, that, uh, that gray-legged leg insect, um, that's a squash bug, an immature squash bug, and it's very common on, on squash. And, and it doesn't matter if you are in Maryland, if you are in Louisiana, or if you are in California, those key pests of, of these major crops have followed these crops around the world. Um, so they might vary you know, in their severity from one part of the country to another. Um, but whatever crop you're growing, you know, there's usually one or, or two or three kind of key insect pests that you will see in the garden. So it's not like you have to memorize a huge amount, um, but, but check that out and, and learn more about the, the key pests for, for each crop. All right, um, and look for resistant ones. So depending on the, insect and the crop, there may be ones out there that, that um, have different types of natural resistance to that crop. And, and certainly this goes hand in hand with learning the key pests is to ID the insects before doing anything. So the image down there on the bottom, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but it's kind of this, this crazy looking insect. And if you've never seen it before and you saw it on your plant and then you saw a hole in the leaf, then you might make the assumption that that is uh, an insect that you don't want around um, that's eating your plant. But actually, in fact, that insect is the, the um, larval stage of the um, ladybird beetle or the ladybug. Um, so that's a predatory insect and that's feeding on a lot of other species of insect that that might be trying to eat your plant. So that would be considered a, a good guy that you'd want to have in your garden. All right, and so if you are um, dealing with some of those key pests, um, I just wanna to talk touch briefly on pesticide use and safety. You wanna use the most targeted product available, right? We appreciate all the work that our pollinators do in the garden and we wanna keep them around. And um, so you wanna choose the most targeted product available to manage the pests that you are, are um, treating. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, treatment isn't really, you know, the insect isn't doing a whole lot of damage, maybe making a few holes here and there. And so it doesn't really warrant treatment, um, but, if, but if it does, um, like with the, the caterpillars on your kale seedlings, um, if you don't do something, you probably won't have any kale seedlings at all. And um, so you want to choose the most targeted product available to control that pest. And there's some great insect guides um, on, on the um, Home and Garden Information Center, uh, as well as your, your extension service in, in whatever state you're tuning in from. Um, and don't spray most insecticides during bloom. And um, every product, every pesticide that has an EPA registration number on it 
has a label, and that is the legal document that helps you know how to apply the product in a safe and also effective way. Um, so definitely take your time to, to read that label. It's on the bottle or the container that you bought it with. You can also find them online as a PDF. If you can't read the tiny, um, the tiny print that's often on those, those labels in the, the paper version that's attached to the container, you can pull up the PDF online and, and take a look at it there. Um, and so let's see. I will mention though, to, to avoid some of the, the home recipes that you maybe will see online or on social media, um, you know, where you just add um, a, you know, just a, a bit of um, Epsom salt and dish soap and um, other materials and, and spray it on your plants and it'll kill everything that's bad and not anything that's good uh, and your plants will grow healthy. Uh, well, the, the problem with that is that unlike uh, registered uh, pesticides, these have not been um, screened for their, their either their effectiveness or their, their safety. Um, so you could be doing more, more harm than, than good by, by adding some of those, um, using them especially to, to control um, insects. All right, so getting to the, the planting part, um, especially for those of you in Maryland and the broader mid-Atlantic region, I encourage you to think about planting um, in a couple different seasons and not just planting as kind of a, a one-time or one season event that you might do in the spring and then you know enjoy that, um, but think about it as, as a number of different seasons. So right now we're thinking about planting for our warm season crop since we're already in early May. And then in the later, uh, late, late uh, summer to early fall, think about planting a cool season planting of, um, of your next harvest that you'll enjoy in the fall and even into the early or, or mid part of the winter. So for our warm season, we're thinking about crops that, that like the heat and that really can't um, take frost. So things like tomatoes and beans and cucumbers, as well as peppers and so forth. In the cool season, um, there are some crops you know, that, that can take the heat and can also take a bit of frost. So things like chard um, can take cool weather, but it can also tolerate the Maryland um, warmer summers. And Let's see. So uh, again, not as a single event. The difference between growing in the spring versus the fall is that in the spring now we have the advantage of those longer days. So if you compare May the 1st, right, that third bar, um, we have more daylight then compared to September the 1st. Um, so although we might have similar temperatures right now as in October, we have longer days, and um, so once things warm up, then, then you can see faster plant growth just because of the, the longer days. Um, and a good thing to have in a gardener tool bag is just an inexpensive thermometer because you can take the soil's temperature and you can see if the timing is right for some of those warm season crops. So for the warm season crop, um, we're gonna um, wait till the soil temperature is is about um, at least 60 degrees. So the, the things like tomatoes and um, cucumbers and squash and things like that do really prefer the soil temperature up um, in, in at least the 60 degree range. Um, not that they'll die if it's cooler than that, but if, if it's in the 50s or so, it won't kill your tomato plant, but they'll just be hanging out waiting for the soil temperature to warm up a bit. All right. So we're going to go into some of the different crops that you might uh, think about growing. And I encourage you, yeah, to enjoy, to grow what you enjoy eating. There's a lot of different, you know, colors and shapes and sizes and varieties if you just flip through a seed catalog. Um, so 
you know, get creative and have, have fun with it. Just a quick note as far as buying seeds and, and transplants now during COVID-19, uh, if you're doing mail order seeds, expect delays. So a lot of the seed companies are, are running at least 10 days uh, behind schedule. So you might place an order and it will be um, 10 days or more before they're, asked, before they're able to, to ship that order. And um, so just, just expect that um, as you're planning out your garden and the timing of, of your planting. Um, mail order is a great way to, to purchase seeds just because you can get greater variety and um, you, can, um, you can pick the, the varieties that you, you want. And um, so even if you don't plant it now in the spring, but maybe you're thinking ahead to the fall season, uh, you can place an order now, and um, then you'll you'll have that in time for for thinking out your your fall garden. If you're buying transplants, I encourage you to to buy smaller ones. Uh, from a value standpoint, the smaller tomato plants that you buy in like a six pack, um, again, if you have a space for six tomato plants are much cheaper per plant than, than getting larger size. And oftentimes the, the smaller plants will, will catch up quickly to the larger size plants. Um, so you get more bang for your buck. And maybe you wanna you know, split up a, a six pack of tomatoes uh, with, your, with your friends or, or neighbors. So that's, that's a good way to, to go. Uh, if you are starting stuff from seed, um, then uh, there's a number of ways to do that. You can you know, recycle different containers if you don't have seed starting trays. Like in the upper corner, there's a picture of some basil seedlings that are growing in a, a piece of a, a water bottle. The bottom is cut off. Um, if you are recycling containers, just think about um, the ability to, to get that out of the container when it's time to, to transplant. So something that's a little bit flexible will help you to, to pull out and gently remove those, those delicate transplants to then plant in the garden. Um, and you will need some type of, of supplemental lighting typically to, to grow really uh, strong, sturdy plants that, that don't, get, uh, don't get spindly. All right. So I'm going to go through a couple different crops, a number of different crops here that are good options for, for small spaces. Um, lettuce and spinach and, and other leafy greens. These are great ones to, to grow in a container garden or in raised beds. Um, now um, we're kind of on the, on the tail end. I, I would encourage you to, um, if you're in Maryland, to, to think about putting in transplants at, at this point, um, or to think about growing them for the fall and, and seeding that lettuce or that spinach kind of August through early September. And these guys, they don't need a whole lot of depth. So again, you can grow in the shallow containers and save some of that, that potting mix. Um, and you know, plant a succession of these. You can plant one row this week, or one row one week, and then wait a couple weeks to, to plant another row. So you have a continual harvest. And you always have, always have something that you can, can uh, harvest from the garden for your, your salads. Beets and Swiss chard, so these, they're actually the same species, but one was developed for its uh, uh, big you know, sugary root, and the other for its, its colorful leaves. So these guys, again, they can, they can take cooler weather. They can also take some of the heat. Although when the summer is really hot and dry, then they, they do start stressing out. So um, this is another good one to, to plant multiple batches of. So you've got um, different, um, different containers or different rows that are coming in to harvest um, throughout the season. With beets, you can eat both the root and, 
in the tops. So I encourage you not to not to throw that away. So anything where I can eat both the above and below ground part of the plant to me is a win-win. A if you're growing them for their, their root, if you're growing those beets, then make sure that there is enough space in the container for that, that beet root to, to fully develop. Um, so they do require a bit more rooting depth than stuff like lettuce. Kale, this is a kind of a, a cool season champ. They can take a fair amount of, of cold weather. They can oftentimes in, in many parts of Maryland, they can survive the winter. And they, they, they do really well. Um, so this time of year is, is not the best time to, to start the kale, but you can think about that for your fall garden um, because they, they don't perform as well during the heat of the summer. Um, kale, like, the, like its relatives, Brussels sprouts and cabbage and collards and so forth, they get a number of species of caterpillars, like I mentioned earlier. And um, so you can see them on the underside of the leaves. Now, a good way to control these is a, a product called Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT. And it's a bacterially derived insecticide that is very uh, targeted and specific. And um, so it, it affects caterpillars when they eat the leaves that um, that it has been sprayed on um, so it is it doesn't harm um, other insects it, it's just very very targeted to to caterpillars so the the larval stage of of the you know butterflies and and moths so if they're feeding on the underside of the leaves uh, you can can apply that product and they will they'll stop feeding um, it's effective on the the younger stages so you want to catch them before they get really big and and out of control and and this product can can very safely and effectively control your your caterpillar pests all right radish uh another cool season crop um that uh is is pretty quick growing and so i would say you could still plant some radish in the month of may here if you're in the mid-Atlantic region, they grow really quickly. You can eat both the, the, the roots, that's what they're mostly grown for. But if you forget about them and the weather gets warm and uh, they go to flowering, you can also eat the seed pods. So you can see the seed pods there over on the right. They look somewhat like, like pea pods and if you catch them before they get really, you know, tough and, and fibrous, then they, again, they're, they're kind of like a pea pod. They have a little bit of the spiciness of a radish and, and more sweetness. So again, if you um, miss out on the roots, you can, can get those and just use them. You can toss them in stir fries and, and things like that. Um, you can grow radishes in pretty small spaces. They, they don't require a whole lot of rooting depth. Um, carrots, these ones do require a bit more rooting depth, um, and you can get them in lots of different colors. So it's fun, especially with kids, you know, to grow something that's that's a little unique as far as some of the different colors that are available: the oranges, purples, yellows, and whites. Um, they're warm season crop. There's few insect pests that that bother them. Um, and with these too, you can use the whole plant, so both the the uh, the roots, and you can use the the tops like parsley, because uh, they're also uh, related to parsley. And let's see if we can get this video to play. This is a a caterpillar that's a specialist on parsley, and it has this kind of cool defense mechanism that it uses to scare off intruders like me in the garden. Um, so if you are growing parsley or carrots, that's kind of a neat thing that you might see in the garden. Um, and th they don't hurt you with those things. They're just these um, orange kind of stinky protrusions that they use to as a scare tactic. All right, beans, another good plant that you might add to your raised beds or to your containers. Um, they do take up a bit more space than some of the others 
that, that we've talked about so far. These ones, you want to just direct seed them. There's no need to, to transplant. They have a pretty large seed, and they can germinate pretty readily. Um, and things like bush beans work well. If you have some sort of trellis, you could consider adding a, a pole bean variety. And those are climbing. You can see them like in that picture there. They're climbing up um, a, a lightweight uh, wire fence. Good thing to plant in successions, especially in the mid-Atlantic here. Uh, the Mexican bean beetle is a very common insect. Uh, if you see it there, it, it looks like a, a ladybird beetle and it will feed on the leaves and it'll, when there's enough of them, they, it'll turn the, the leaves to look like just, just tattered, weathered leaves. If you have that, you can just pick all the beans that are left and then um, just cut down all the bean plants, put those in a black plastic bag and leave them in the sun for a couple of weeks to kill off the, the bean, uh, Mexican bean beetles. And, and then in the meantime, you can plant a second planting uh, for a later harvest. All right. Uh, summer squash or zucchini. These guys um, are very versatile in the kitchen. So um, you can do a lot of a lot of things with them. Certainly make zucchini bread and things like that. And May is the time that you want to think about planting those. You can just direct seed them. Again, no need to, to either spend money on transplants or to, to put the work into, into growing them. Just, just pop the seed in the ground. Um, and with zucchini, most of the varieties are bush varieties. So they will, um, although they can get fairly large, they um, won't um, spread around or you know go out of your um, your garden. Um, if you have vining varieties, then you can also run them up a trellis. There's a couple key insects. I mentioned the squash bug, and I showed that picture on the left. Um, that's the immature stage, and then they will uh, develop into the adults. Oftentimes, you'll see those bronze eggs that will be on the underside, oftentimes, or the or the top of the leaf, and you can just squish those if you see them. These are are pretty difficult to control, unfortunately. Um, all of the insecticide products that are effective on these are also. Um, more broad spectrum insecticides. Um, but if you see them, certainly squish them uh, before they get out of hand. There's a couple of fungal diseases, especially here in, in the humid summers of the mid-Atlantic in Maryland, um, that we'll see things like downy mildew and powdery mildew. Um, you can look for resistant varieties if you're flipping through your seed catalog or browsing online. and um, so uh, a couple different ways to, to, to manage that. Um, squash vine borer is another kind of key pest of summer squash and zucchini. And on the bottom picture, you'll see, um, you'll see the, the results. So there's uh, a larva that's feeding on the inside of the stem of that plant. And um, if you cut it open, you can sometimes find the the larva burrowing and tunneling. So it weakens the stem and eventually the stem snaps. So if all of a sudden you go out and your zucchini plants are, are wilted, then um, there's a good chance that squash vine borer uh, was the culprit. Cucumber, these are, are great for, for compact gardens because they are, are pretty easy to trellis. You can grow them on um, up fencing and you can, um, you can let them climb a lot of different materials. These, you just want to direct seed. So again, no need to transplant. A lot of different varieties out there, pickling and slicing varieties. Um, and here's a picture from, from my backyard last season. This was a, a variety that, that really did, did well. Um, insect pests that you will always or almost always see on cucumber are squash bugs. There's a striped, or I'm sorry, uh, cucumber beetle, which is what you see in that top picture in the cucumber flower. And there's a striped one that you see there and also a spotted one. They'll also feed on other plants, but they're very common on cucumbers. Squash bugs will also get on cucumbers. And um, 
let's see. So they can be can be difficult to control the cucumber beetle, and um, some strategies include using a, a row cover, which is this lightweight material that you see in the photo below that you can order from from different uh, seed companies and other supply places. Um, that can exclude the insects, so you want to keep that on the plants until they get to that bloom stage where you want the the pollinators to come in and and pollinate. Um, with cucumbers, there are varieties that are um, that can produce fruit that can produce cucumbers without pollination. Um, so if you're looking through a seed catalog and it says Parthenocarpic, then that means it can produce cucumbers even if the flowers are not pollinated. All right, and so a couple disease resistant varieties. Um, Bristol is the one that I grew last year. And there's a couple other, uh, Corinto is also very disease resistant. Uh, and Tasty Jade is a Japanese uh, type slicing cucumber. Uh, that's, that's really sweet, uh, really crunchy. So you can, can check those out. Um, tomatoes, these are the most popular garden crop and one of my favorites. If you're growing in small spaces, Look at some of the determinant varieties that, that don't grow as tall as, as indeterminate. Basically, determinant means that it'll max out at a, at a shorter height and not continue to grow throughout the growing season. There's also some dwarf or patio type tomatoes that are also available. And, and we're seeing more of that, especially in the past couple of years, there's been better selections. If you go out to garden centers and greenhouses, um, it seems like the industry is catering more to people trying to grow tomatoes in, in small spaces. And so they've accommodated with, with better selection of, of varieties. If you're going out to a garden center to buy plants, or if you're going out to a store to buy seeds, I encourage you to take a, a seed catalog with you or just pull up a, a seed um, company website so you can get more information on the varieties because typically on the little packet, you don't get a whole lot of, of information. All right. Um, and so one issue that you often see with tomatoes is, is cat facing, and that's caused by, um, by low temperatures that, that resulted in poor pollination. So the fruit didn't develop normally, and that's why it just looks weird. So they'll still ripen, they'll just be kind of malformed, and you can still eat it, just, just cut away the, the other, um, the other um, kind of um, brownish tissue. All right, um, very common issue you see in tomatoes is blossom end rot, which is caused by a local deficiency in, in calcium. So basically the plant didn't take up enough calcium in, and distribute it all the way to the end of that developing tomato fruit. Now, typically the most common cause of that is not a lack of calcium in the soil, but just a lack of, of even water uptake. So that can be either excessive, um, excessively dry soils or excessively moist soils because in either instance, um, the plant can have difficulty uh, taking up those dissolved minerals. Uh, so if you are growing in containers and they get dried out, then that can result in, in blossom end rot. Uh, it's not the end of the world. You can just cut off that brownish part and eat the rest of the tomato. All right, you'll also likely to see hornworms. So tobacco hornworms are these really big green caterpillars that you'll sometimes find on tomato plants. Um, if you see big ones like this, you can just you know, pick them off and, and get them out of your garden because they can really do, do a lot of damage. Um, but like, luckily they, they, are, they can get pretty big. So they, when they're larger like that, they're more easy to, to spot. Um, so yeah, the, they are pretty well camouflaged, but when you run across one, um, you might, if you haven't seen one before, you'll think, wow, that's a, that's a big caterpillar. All right. Stink bugs are another pest that you'll find on tomatoes and, um, they're a sucking insect. So they don't take out, they don't take chunks out from the fruit, but they do cause this damage that you see there, kind of that light colored, almost like corky. Um, tissue because they're they're uh, basically taking their straw and, and sucking out the tomato juice. 
Um, so again, it's, it's still fine to eat that fruit, but it just makes the, the texture not as good. Um, unfortunately, these guys are, are pretty difficult to manage. Again, like your squash bugs, the insecticides that uh, are effective on this are more broad spectrum. Um, so if you can just tolerate the damage, that's usually best. They're not going to kill the tomato plants. They're just sucking some of the, the juices. All right, and some of the common tomato diseases, the two most common in Maryland are early blight and septoria leaf spot. And for most um, diseases in the, in the garden, the best thing to do, especially with tomatoes, is just prune off those, those lower leaves that are starting to get really diseased. Um, you'll have these on pretty much any tomato plant that you grow. Um, so it's not the end of the world. Um, just prune those off and that can sometimes slow the spread of these diseases, but usually the plants will still be able to produce a, a harvest even if they have some of these issues. All right, um, and then I think this is my last crop here. I threw in one herb. Um, there's certainly a lot more, but basil is a really nice one. If we're thinking about annual, easy to grow herb plants, uh, you can start them from seed. Uh, now is getting a bit late to, to start these indoors for transplanting outside, um, but uh, if you can readily find them at garden centers and greenhouses. There's a lot of different colors, so look and, and see some of the, the diversity out there. Um, you've got purples, there's one down there, the, the bottom photo, it's green leaves with, with those purplish flower heads, so it can blend in to both an ornamental and a vegetable garden. Uh, there is, especially in the mid-Atlantic, there is a problem with this disease called uh, downy mildew of basil. This is a disease that only affects basil, um, this particular downy mildew. And um, so if you are in this region, consider looking for some of these resistant varieties. A number of them were developed up at, at Rutgers and they are, are resistant to, to this disease, uh, as well as some of the Thai type basil and, and certainly the holy basil or Tulsi is uh, naturally uh, more resistant than the Italian types. If you do get downy mildew on your basil, you can just uh, take the whole plant, harvest that and, and make a bunch of pesto the disease itself is not harmful to, to humans, but it will, um, over a several week course, uh, take out those, those basil plants. So if you see it starting, then um, there's really not anything you can do. There's no prevention and there's no treatment, um, but it's really time to, to make a bunch of pesto, I guess. All right, um, so yeah, those are some of the crops to think about. Um, and, and as far as maintenance, just kind of recapping what I, some of the things I've gone through. Again, going out there and, and watering, water deeply and less frequently, um, using mulch to keep weeds in check, and also uh, pulling weeds when they're younger uh, helps to, to keep a handle on some of those weed issues. Making use of that vertical space, like with the cucumbers or any vining crops. Here's a watermelon that's grown in a raised bed. This is in Baltimore City. And so, you know, typically watermelon will spread and take up a lot of space, but you can um, just with, with smart trellising, using some, some steel T-posts and some, um, some welded wire fencing, make a, a trellis so you can grow some of those vining crops even in, in smaller spaces, uh, as well as get out in the garden and be on the lookout for some of those insects and some of those diseases that I mentioned. Um, and Again, if you're starting out for the first time this year, start small so you don't get frustrated by partway through the season and just wanna throw in the towel. And also think of veggie gardening as more than just a, you know, kind of a one season endeavor where you're planting in the spring and maybe tending it and harvesting in the summer. Also think about what's my next crop? What do I wanna plant come late summer for a, a fall and winter harvest? Um, and get used, uh, just check out some of the, the different varieties um, because there's some really neat veggies that maybe you haven't 
uh, tried in, in those particular varieties. All right. And just some of the resources I wanted to mention, a couple good places. So there's a Garden Professors uh, blog and, and Facebook group, and a lot of really good science-based gardening information is shared there, as well as articles on their, their blog. Um, especially for Marylanders, the Home and Garden Information Center has a lot of really in-depth information on vegetable gardening and other gardening topics as well. And if you love to garden and want to share that with others, consider becoming a Master Gardener volunteer. Certainly, if you're in Maryland, we'd love to have you join the, the program. And if you are anywhere else in the country, there's an active uh, Master Gardener program through your land grant university. So um, with that, let's see, I will try and um, manage to answer some of the questions here. And yes, the recording, a couple of people have asked, the recording will be available on, on YouTube within the next couple of days. And, and I will email that link out to everyone that registered. All right. And okay, if you have a question, let me see, you can, Try and answer some of those questions. Yeah, let's see. Um, so just looking at the chat box here. Uh, can you elaborate on trellis suggestions for containers or small raised beds? And let's see. Yeah, so trellising can look like a lot of things. Things like cucumbers vine pretty readily. And, and so a trellis can be something as, as simple as, as just um, chicken wire or lightweight fencing between two steel posts. Um, you can also you know, use steel posts and, and just zigzag some lightweight plastic twine like a tomato twine. And, and that's enough for, for those um, plants to, to vine up. Um, all right, um, and a couple other. Um, yeah, questions about rooting depth. So um, if you are growing just, just your um, greens and things like that, you can get by with a, a shallower container about five inches or so. If you're growing something like beets, then you want it, um, you know, I'd say more like, like 10 inches of, of rooting depth for, for those plants. Um, and, and if you're growing things like tomatoes, uh, again, kind of that four to seven gallon container is, is what you'll want just for that, um, for that space. Granted, the smaller the container, the, um, the uh, more often you'll have to water. All right, and as we're trying to get the uh, question action here organized, and then people that use that during the presentation. All right, so we got a, a couple of questions here. Topics about um, where to, to send a soil sample. Um, so if you're in Maryland or the Mid-Atlantic, you can, can check out the um, Maryland Home and Garden Information Center. If you just type in Maryland um, soil testing, then you should get to that, that website. And there's a step-by-step -step video on how to take the sample, as well as a list of labs in the region to, to mail that sample off to. All 
All right, and now, let's see, a number of folks had questions about where to, to find, where to source some of these materials like good mulch and, and good compost. Um, and, and that can be difficult. Um, so if you're looking at, um, at a good, good mulch, if you're looking for a lot of mulch, you can, um, can use arborist wood chips. So if you have a, a tree company that's working in the area, um, oftentimes they're trying to get rid of that. Um, so usually that that's, comes in a large quantity, but if you have a, a landscape um, beds that, that could use some mulch, that's a good source. Um, you know, a lot of the, the bag products uh, will, will work as well. Um, for, for container, for potting soil and things like that, um, you can, um, you can certainly get the bagged products, um, for bulk products, it, it, it can be difficult. I would also always encourage you to, to take a look at what you're buying before you get delivery, before you take delivery of that product again. So you know that it's, um, it doesn't look like, um, like mostly mulch, um, but that it, it does, um, contain, uh, contain soil. Um, and you can you can have that tested as well um, to to know what the uh, what the quality what the nutrient content of that that soil is. Oh, where to get? Um, yeah, and as far as uh, questions on where to purchase seeds, you can you know contact if you have a favorite uh, seed company. I can't you know recommend uh, one company over another, but um, if you have a favorite seed company that you've used in the past you can can reach out to them and see what their delays what the delivery times might be um, you can also go into um, if you are um, able to to go out and and um, shop for seeds um, then uh, you can um, again go out to your your big box stores or garden centers and and see what kind of selection they they have and again you can reference um, for more information on those varieties you can pull up a, a seed company website to get more info than than what might be just on the back of that packet And let's see, I think there are some questions on, on composting and, and uh, worm composting. Um, again, I can't recommend, if you're looking for sources for, for worms, I can't recommend one company over another. Um, but for a lot of good resources on worm composting, how to get started, uh, I would encourage people to check out NCSU. Uh, they have a really good, or North Carolina State University extension has a really good page so if you just google ncsu vermicomposting you'll find um, there's an extension specialist there who uh, works a lot with vermicomposting and there's a lot of good resources there and if you have other questions or if i didn't cover something that you had actually on my next slide here have um, there's my my contact information at the the bottom there. All right, um, and for low light conditions, um, there's a question about what herbs or greens are best, and and really there, uh, you can you can um, I would say grow grow what you like um, the. You know things like basil. You can can grow those with uh, with less light certainly than um, than a tomato plant. All of them would grow better in in full sunlight, um, but most herbs should be able to should be able to grow in in lower light conditions. All right. Yes. Yeah. And if you see in the chat box, um, there's also uh, my my email address is is just posted there. Um, let's see. Mary, Mary, 
Jersey, Virginia, and Southeast Texas. And want to know how the information might change. Uh, and um, just recapping some of the questions as far as regional differences. Um, yeah, some of these crops, um, if you're within, again, the mid Atlantic region, Maryland, um, Virginia, Delaware, and, and, um, and uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, um, this, most of these uh, plants and, and schedules are, are pretty similar. Um, outside of that, I encourage you to, to check with your, your local cooperative extension service. Um, again, you can just, if you type in your state and then the topic, whether it's vegetable gardening and then EDU, you should come to uh, a web page from your extension service in, in your state to get more specific kind of regional information. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, another uh, kind of lettuce question. As far as the lettuce box, that's about um, five inches deep, the one in the in the photo. And um, a question about newspaper. The um, newsprint in the past had contained in some of the inks, there were heavy metals, things like cadmium, et cetera. Um, the, the new, they're the modern newsprint inks uh, do not contain heavy metals, so there's there's not a, a issue with um, with leaching of, of heavy metals from from uh, modern uh, newsprint. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as leaching from from other things, such as your your raised bed building materials. Um, that is, you know, something to, to think about. Um, so I wouldn't use, um, you know, if, if that, uh, container was used to, you know, certainly to, to store toxic materials, I wouldn't use that in a, in a vegetable garden. Um, there are other building materials that can, can leach, um, compounds. And um, I'll send out, um, there's a, a, pre, a publication on that. I can't think of it off the top of my head. So I will share that in the email when I send out the link to the recorded webinar in, um, you know, within a week. All right, and some questions kind of about pest management. Um, uh, trying to kind of summarize most of them. Speaking specifically about the, the hornworm. Yeah, you want to get that, the hornworm out of your garden. Uh, so if you, if you want to kill it, you can do that. Uh, if you just want to, to, um, to, to bag it and get it out of the garden, that's, that's okay too. When they're they're really big like that, they are voracious feeders, and and they can um, really take a lot of leaves, as well as, as start to feed on on some of the tomato fruit. So you want to get them out of the garden. Um, whatever you do with with them after that is is up to you. Um, let me see. As far as yeah, squirrels and and chipmunks, those little critters, those can be hard to keep out because uh, they're difficult to, to screen out with, with fencing. Um, so you can do you know, things like, uh, for some of the smaller rodents, uh, a finer mesh uh, fencing, things like, like chicken wire, um, put that in a, you, could, you can do a, a enclosure, depending on, on how much time and, and money you, you have to invest in, in building materials. Um, chipmunks certainly like to, to dig. Um, sometimes they will dig around in pots and disturb your your little seedlings. Um, so again, you can put some kind of covering over them, especially when they're small and, and young. They're they're the most vulnerable, and um, so you can put some kind of chicken wire covering. If you're growing in containers, you can just put that 
over the, the top of the pot, uh, at least for the, the early stages. And then once the plants get more established, a little bit of disturbance won't hurt them and set them back quite as much. Uh, right. All right, and, and as far as pots and soil, uh, there uh, you, you can reuse potting mix from, from year to year. It will start to break down over time. So you'll see if you're reusing it, that it will become more, more dense. And so you're reducing uh, some of the ability for that to hold water because it, as it decomposes, it leaves some of, uh, some of that pore space. So uh, a gallon of, of potting mix in year one won't hold the same amount of, of soil as that as the same volume of, of weathered potting mix as it's as it started to break down. Uh, so you can you can keep on using it um, and and then just add some new mix to it to replenish. Um, after a number of years, you might just you know if you have two gardens, you might add that to your your in-ground garden and, and get new uh, fresh mix in your containers. You can also use regular soil, just your native garden soil in your containers if you have that available. And um, it is, it's heavier. So when, when you're filling containers and, and certainly moving containers, it, it's a bit more work. Uh, so it's a nice thing about, about some of the potting mix in, in containers is it makes it lighter weight and easier to move when it's when it's dry but but certainly you can you can use native soil in in containers without a problem and yeah as far as planting different types of plants together in one pot you, you can do that and and the plants are are fine with that you know you can plant different types of herbs together in in one pot some might be more uh, vigorous growers. If you plant mint in with basil, then probably by the end of the season, the, the mint will have um, competed a, a fair amount with your, your basil. So you might have some you know, competition and stunting issues um, if you have a really vigorous grower in with a, a less vigorous grower. Um, but you, you certainly can plant multiple different plant species in the same container, given, given that there's enough space for, uh, for the, the roots. Um, and a question about healthy tomato plants that look nice and lush, but aren't producing fruit. That can often be caused by, by excessive nitrogen because when, when tomato plants have lots of nitrogen, then they'll just stay in their in their vegetative stage and not really produce many fruit, not many uh, flowers, and and not many tomato fruit as as a result. So um, if if you have really lush green tomato plants but not much fruit, then it's probably due to to over fertilization. All right, um, and questions as containers, um, different materials. Uh, let's see, so you can, yeah, you can use a lot of different materials and, and reuse them um, with, you know, you can get things like, like grow bags or basically bags that are made out of a, a type of textile that are lightweight and flexible. Um, the textile type bags, they do tend to, to dry out a bit faster because you can get evaporation not only from the, the surface of the container, but also from the sides. So they, they will wick away moisture a bit faster than, than just the plastic or, or ceramic type, uh, type pots. Um, 
you but you can you can uh, grow in those. Um, let's see. As far as uh, someone asked about using a kiddie pool as a raised bed, and and yeah, you can use use that um, as a as basically a large container. Again, you'd want to make sure that you put some holes in it, cut some holes out so there's drainage, so it doesn't get filled with excessive rainwater. Um, and let's see, as far as the, um, oh, as far as pressure treated lumber, someone had a question about what is new pressure treated lumber. And um, so that's any that you go out and buy in, in the store now. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head when they phased out the, the previous um, pressure treatment, um, but but what they've been using now for, for the past number of years, and, and any stock that you see in stores now would be that that copper based wood preservative. Um, so it's something that you, you can use. It does not contain arsenic, and uh, you can use it in in raised bed construction. All right, and a question about uh, someone started seedlings, but they got leggy um, and wondering if they can put extra soil up around them, kind of mount up the soil to keep them upright. Um, and and you, that can work for some. For things like tomatoes, they will send out roots uh, if you plant them deep. So they'll they'll send out roots from that stem tissue. And so you can certainly plant things like like tomatoes deep. Um, others are, are trickier to, to plant deep. They won't, um, most of your other crops won't send out roots from the side of the, of the plants. All right. Uh, question about rate or about uh, cucumber diseases. Uh, let me see if I can get back to it. Um, but yeah, for for downy mildew and, and powdery mildew, there are there are some fungicides that you can use. Uh, fungicides tend to be more difficult in the uh, in the home garden to to manage uh, diseases just because. Uh, you typically, uh, for best results, you need to be on a, a preventative uh, spray schedule because when you see the signs of the disease, then it's already there just because um, because the spores are are so much smaller than we can can see. Um, there are some products, but but they are more more difficult to to manage um, because of that that regular uh, spray schedule and the and the timing is oftentimes not really practical. And um, most home gardeners aren't uh, aren't willing to to put into that the the, um, the time uh, of of spraying and and don't really prefer to to spray. That's why I encourage looking for some of those resistant varieties that have at least some level of resistance to to one or more of those powdery or downy mildew. All right, I think that's. If you do have other questions and you're still logged in. Maybe just throw them into the the chat box. I apologize if I if you asked a question maybe a couple times and I didn't get a chance to to answer it. We had I think about um, 800 people logged in um, at the at the max here. Uh, how about let's see mushrooms? Um, I don't really have any information on on mushrooms. Oh, that's that's really not my my area. Um, so, so I apologize, and I will go back. Let's see to the 
the resources page if you want to take a look again at those. Um, check those out. Um, some good information. Um, let's see. Question about um, about neem oil. Uh, so neem there um, is a is a tree that's um, that has a uh, compounds that are um, effective against some pests. So there's a number of different types of products if that are derived from from neem. Those are generally more uh, effective um, than than ones that are just sold as as neem oil. Um, but there are some some effective uh, pest control products and insecticides that are made from from neem oil. All right, and mushroom. Okay, question about mushroom soil. Uh, so mushroom soil is something that you could use to to amend your soils to add organic matter. Sometimes it can be higher in in salts. Um, so just be aware of that. And if you're adding any kind of amendment, whether it's a compost that you have available in your area, it's a good idea to to take some of that before you blend it in with your soil. You can do a quick uh, kind of bioassay, take some of that and, and plant some bean seeds in it. Um, they're a good indicator plant. Um, if there's any um, either high salt level, then they won't grow very well or not germinate at all, um, as well as if there's residues from, from um, herbicides in any kind of compost that you might be thinking about adding to your garden. Um, so yeah, compost, mushroom, compost, those are all things that you can certainly add to the garden and, and can be good sources of organic matter, um, but it's, it's good to, to know your source and to do a little work to, to test it out before you add it. Um, okay, go back to the slide showing soil amounts needed for typical garden spaces. All right, I can try to do that. So there's there's also some good calculators online for getting um, for converting different volumes that that can be can be useful. But just kind of rule the thumb. I can flip back to that part. Um, all right, I think it's a question about growing in, in shallow raised beds. And uh, if, you, if you're growing in shallow raised beds, but the soil beneath that is, you know, if you're not limiting, if you're not lining the bottom because of, you know, soil contamination issues or things like that, then plants not only have the depth of, you know, the height of the, the raised bed, but they can also grow into the, the soil beneath that. Um, so it, but if all you have is like that six inch layer, then you, know, you can certainly grow stuff. Oh, there it is. Okay. You can certainly grow things like, uh, like greens, um, but you will have to, uh, again, the, the shallower the container, the less rooting depth, and the more often you will have to, to water. Um, so yeah, you can grow greens and, and stuff like in there, uh, especially taller plants. They need the, the rooting depth, both for, for water and nutrients, but also for, for anchoring, right? So you, if you had a big, tall tomato plant on a windy porch, it could fall over if, uh, if you don't have enough weight on the bottom. Uh, think of that, that soil in the container as somewhat of a ballast, keeping it from blowing over in the wind, uh, as well as just, just not enough to, to, uh, to hold it and it could, it could uproot. Um, let me see. What is the reason for tiny tomatoes? Someone asks. And the the reason for for smaller and more compact tomato plants is that you can grow them in smaller containers. So, uh, and I'm not sure exactly if that's what the question was getting at, um, or if you're referring to the smaller tomato um, tomato fruit like like cherry tomatoes. Um, but small tomato plants can work well in, in smaller containers and patio gardens without getting, you know, five, six feet tall. Um, all right.
right, question about, someone has asked about, uh, if I buy an already grown basil plant and transplant it to a container, can I still keep it indoors? And, and yeah, you can keep it indoors. You wanna try and find a, a sunny spot as possible, um, but it'll, it'll grow indoors assuming that there is is enough light uh, you can also you know put it outside if you have a, a space for that and it'll start to to fill in that container uh, let's see question about um so i have a Wooden vertical garden with four tiers. What plants would you suggest for each tier? Um, with uh, probably lettuce starting on the, the top because of its small size. And, and again, I'm not sure exactly how big those, those tiers are, but you can, uh, depending on the, on the, the total rooting area, um, you, you should be able to grow a number of, of different crops in there. Um, you could, again, kind of thinking of, uh, um, you know, a space for a tomato here, if you've got kind of that, well, you know, kind of four to four to six or so gallon area or volume for tomato plants. If it's a smaller compact variety, then you don't need quite as much as, as that. Um, and, you know, think about plant height. So if, if its mature size is, uh, if you're growing a you know eggplant that has a mature size of four feet, then um, then look at growing a, a more compact type. Um, so not just think about rooting depth, but also about the plant height. Will this be shading out its neighbor, and and so forth. All right. Um, tips on or questions about covering plants. So if you have frost in the in the forecast, then yeah, you would want to go out and cover those at night so they don't get get nipped if they're things like tomatoes, peppers, basil, any of those warm season plants that that can't handle frost. Um, so you can cover them with with tarps, um, any kind of lightweight plastic sheeting usually unless it's a hard frost will provide enough you know a couple degrees protection is usually all that that you need you can put you know container of of water underneath that that can provide a bit more um, it's really the the cold and dry mornings or you know late nights when when you'll you'll see the frost um, that that nips and, and damages the the plants. Um, yeah, and, and we don't know um, what the spring weather will bring. So um, that's the the nice thing about having multiple seasons. So if you plant something and it doesn't do that great this spring, be it too cold or too warm, think about planting for for the fall for that that extra season. Uh, and good luck as you all start off on the veggie gardening this season. <laughs>